Hey, welcome everybody. So we are four MACE practitioners and we're going to have an interesting conversation about the work that we do and why it's so transformational. So Meg and Janet and I did a video previously where we introduced ourselves. So I'll put a link somewhere where you can just go to that video. We won't take our time today, but today we are joined by Jerry Marzinski and um, welcome everybody. I wonder if we could start off with Jerry just sharing a little bit about your background in mental health and um, what your work has been and how you now use the MACE Energy Method. Well, my name is Jerry Marzinski. I'm a, a retired licensed psychotherapist. And I got uh, close to 50 years of experience in mental health on the front lines. Um, and most of that time I was studying the thought processes of the criminally insane and schizophrenics. Um, and what I saw in school and what I saw on the front lines is they didn't know what caused mental illness. I mean, they had all these names, they had this big DSM with hundreds of mental illnesses in there, but there was no, nothing about the cause. And I'm like, what's going on here? You know, you. you you have all this schooling. I mean, I've been uh, graduated with a, a BA in psychology in, in Temple University, a master's degree in counseling from uh, University of Georgia, and spent two years in a PhD program. They didn't know what caused mental illness. They they just, you know, they had all these theories, you know, but, but there there was no cures. I mean, none of that counseling that they taught me worked on the front lines. So um, I just I, I just went on uh, working with schizophrenics and studying their thought processes. Um, so I, I worked in uh, one of the biggest uh, psychiatric state hospitals on the planet. There were close to 10,000 mental patients there when I got there. Uh, I'm a commercial pilot, I'm a certified scuba diver, I'm a second lieutenant in the Civil Air, uh, Civil Air Patrol. Um, I, I got the Apple Award for teaching abnormal psych, uh, psychology in, in uh, uh, Pima College. Spent two years in a PhD program, um, co-author of An Amazing Journey Through the Psychotic Mind. Uh, and I've never seen anything work like MACE. I mean, it, it's, it's a very different approach in, in all the all the counseling theories and all the in-service training I've had, there wasn't any spiritual component. And we're spiritual beings, we're energetic beings, and the establishment is totally nor ignoring the spiritual side. Now, MACE was the first psychotherapy that I've seen that takes into account the spiritual side of things. You know? um, it's, it's a, a, a very scientific approach combined with a spiritual component, and it can't function without that spiritual component. So John Mace, who came up with it, uh, with this system, he was, uh, I think he got his master's in counseling finally, but he, he wasn't a psychiatrist or a psychologist or anybody like that. He was a master mariner and a ship's captain. So he had to know stuff about... Um, uh, energy. He had to know about electricity. He had to know about magnetism. He had to know about magnetic fields and electric current. Um, and he was also a very spiritual fellow. So he he put all this stuff together and knew that the human being was an energetic being. I mean, your thoughts are energy. Your memory is energy. Your feelings are energy. Your spirit is energy. You know, and there's a flow of energy throughout your body. So he made the comparison between the flow of energy and physics with the flow in the body. Okay? And he was able to link those together. He found that negative energy moves toward uh, positive energy. Okay? So if you get a battery, it's the negative pole, the, the electrons from the negative pole that move through the whatever's resisting and back into the positive pole. Now, he, he discovered and, and, or knew that the spirit was positive energy. And 
he knew that there were pockets of negative energy that were created during a trauma. And these pockets of negative energy would stay there like a computer program or like a, uh, a computer virus. Right? Um, and they were caused by trauma. Okay, So during a trauma, there's a horrible feeling and it just doesn't go away. It just stays there and torments whoever, whoever experienced the trauma. And your energy or, and attention is turned on that trauma. And during that trauma, you make a, uh, a decision about you know, who you are in relation to that trauma. And it's usually not a good decision because you don't make good decisions during trauma. So what happens is there's a, a horrible feeling that stays there and it just won't go away. So the ego shows up and it goes, here, I'll handle this for you. It takes it and it buries it in the subconscious mind and then locks it down so it can't get out. And it's still buried alive. So what happens is whoever caused that trauma, whenever somebody like that shows up in your psychic sphere, there's a reaction to this buried alive program that the ego buried. And it gets projected out to that person out there that looks like or reminds you of the person who caused the trauma. And that sets off an automatic reaction to either attack or run or avoid. And the universe keeps sending you people like that. It's like the person you hate keeps coming around over and over again. It's like the universe is saying, something's wrong here, something's wrong here. And your ego keeps projecting out and saying, it's them, it's them, it's them. Because when they show up, I feel bad. You know? mm -hmm. And there's no knowledge of this buried trauma in there that, that keeps getting triggered over and over again. So what happens, it gets triggered so many times that people just go, well, that's just me. You know, when I ever run into that kind of person, I just don't like them. That's just who I am. And they've come to believe that that's them. Um, but it's not, okay? It's a, what John Mace called a negative identity. Okay? So that's negative energy that's kind of buried in the subconscious mind. Now, the problem he had over his last years was how do you find that, you know, in, in the entire subconscious mind? How do you find where this trauma is buried? And that's where the spiritual part comes in. Right? The spirit helps us find where that thing is buried. And it does it through images. You're asked to find and you're asked to you find the trauma turn it into an image. And once you've got the image, that's the location. Once you have the location, there's a method to discreate that trauma. And it happens very quickly. You know, so stuff that you might think take would take years and years and years to get rid of, major traumas, are they're gone within an hour or a half hour. They're gone. And they no longer exist in the person's um, uh, psychological sphere. So you, you ask them, okay, how do you feel about that trauma now? Well, I remember it, but it doesn't bother me. Okay. And I've seen this over and over and over again in the years I've been working with MACE. I, it, it's just an amazing system. It gets to the cause of the trauma and it discreates it. So it's no longer in the person's psychological sphere. You know, and I've had, uh, uh, I was talking to these these guys a minute ago about a, a lady I had who was 85 years old who had something happen to her when she was three years old that made her feel like she was worthless and didn't deserve to live. She went through her entire life, like 82 years, with that belief mm -hmm. that was buried in her mind and it, it devastated her life. You know, I felt so sorry for her when we, we got rid of it in a half hour. It was gone. It was out of her it was out of her psyche. So this stuff is almost like magic. Like I said, in all the years I've been working on the front lines of mental health, I have never seen anything like MACE. Right. So I don't want to hog all this up. I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it helps it for like people that, to hear. But it's not magic. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, very, it's very scientific. But you're right, it works like magic. So it's well, and I I think it's helpful to hear some of the case studies because before we pushed record, I was saying that I just did a session earlier today 
with a woman who was probably my age, you know, 50s, and was raped by her father as a child and had the feeling that she felt was extreme fear, like I'm going to die. And the decision she made about herself was I'm unloved. Mm -hmm. And the ability to clear that in 30 minutes and then proceed with the rest of the session is it's amazing. I know it does seem like magic, but we're not manipulating anyone. They're doing the work. Their spiritual being is doing the work. So I, th I think that anybody who has experienced trauma, and it doesn't have to be severe trauma like we just mentioned. It could be just a, a more mild upset that still creates these negative energy patterns, right? Yeah, I've been surprised by, you know, traumas that some of these people have that I would just kind of shake off. I mean, for them, those are major traumas. Yeah. What would be an example of that? Oh, uh, like the the father beating the dog or something like that. Um, mm. it, it 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 wouldn't it was something that just wouldn't phase me. But for them, I mean, they remember it from the time they were a little kid. Yeah. So, you know, with with every trauma, there is a a reaction. There's the, and, and and what's interesting with mace is once you get the major trauma all the all the attachments to it collapse also mm -hmm. so, so if you know all the like uh, okay so you, you run into somebody who had a, their father was abusive and he's a certain kind of guy all the other people that he had that reminded him or he reacted to with regard to that particular uh, negative identity will also collapse. He will no longer uh, be affected by people that were like his father. That they, there will no be longer be reaction. That the whole chain will collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and Janet also comes out of the mental health arena as a nurse practitioner. And it's just so interesting to me that the go-to is always a psychiatric drug. Right. Uh, uh, that's the answer. Janet yeah. and I had the same thing. We're both sick of, of the traditional, you know, go to the drug stuff. Right. I mean, she was sick of it. I was sick of it. And when we met each other, yeah, we're both sick of it. Yeah. I, I feel like we're, in a sense, whistleblowers. Uh, because we we saw firsthand it didn't work it didn't work at all and, and often it made them worse yeah medication and then we're adding meds on top of meds to prevent side effects from the meds it's it's insane and uh most of us know family members who are on just an incredible amount of meds you know, so imagine these people coming into your office and they're on 10 meds. How do we know it's not the meds causing their their mental health? And I've seen that. <laughs> it's like blood pressure medication side effect. Um, uh, and if you read, read your side effects, it's depression. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking blood pressure medication and now you're depressed, it's probably your medication, you know. So anyways, um, I, I'm so grateful that we're doing this because America needs to hear about MACE. We need to get the word out. It's, it's new to us, um, but it's been around a long time. So I'm grateful we're getting together and, and, and getting the word out. There's hope. Yeah, and, and, and psychiatry and psychology aren't going to want anything to do with this. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, uh, uh, the MACE people took this to... Um, the one of the universities and said you should be teaching this in your colleges instead of the garbage that you're teaching and they demonstrated how well it worked they said well we'll we'll take it if you give us the patent mm -hmm. mace went no no we're not going to give you the patent so they took it to the legislature in australia they showed the legislature how well it worked and said this should be used with veterans and in the mental health centers instead of this the stuff that you're using that doesn't work they just blew it off so yeah. You know, so the pharmaceutical industry is making four point fourteen fourteen point seven billion billion a year selling antipsychotic 
drugs and another 14.7 billion. This is million billion mm-hmm. selling antidepressant drugs that don't work. The, the antipsychotic drugs actually rot out your central nervous system with the long-term uh, patients in psychiatric hospitals when they did autopsies, their brains were shrunk like, like walnuts. And then when they published that research, the big pharma and, and the psychiatric mafia went, no, no, it's not, it's not our medications. It's not our, it's a schizophrenia that's doing that. No, then they started feeding it to rats and, and monkeys and the same thing happened. These, these antipsychotic drugs are toxic. The, those side effects, the horrible side effects, that, those are the toxic effects of these drugs. And all they do is they suppress symptoms. They don't cure anything. They don't get rid of the problem. They just they just suppress the side effects, just like regular psychology. I mean, or psychotherapy. You talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. You stir it up, stir it up. But it it, it next couple of weeks, it's back again. It doesn't go anywhere. Well, and isn't a lot of the DSM and the diagnoses they've cooked up and their connection to pharmaceuticals based on this flawed idea of a chemical imbalance in the brain? Yep, They're that was made. Bad. That was made up by Eli Lilly, and I think it was the seventies when they came out with Prozac. You know, they knew it was a lie at the time. They said they went, "Well, this is a chemical, and the, and the body is a chemical, and this seems to help. So there must be some kind of chemical imbalance." That's one of the first things I saw when I went to work at the big psychiatric hospital. I never, ever saw a psychiatrist take any kind of baseline as to what chemicals in the brain were out of kilter or or not there were there, there was no objective test you know so what they would do is they go well okay this is the symptoms and they go well let's start with this drug and then it would be like a dartboard they just change it one after another after another or, or increase it or decrease it or there there was no objective test to show what chemicals in the brain were out of balance or by how much matter of fact none ever existed Mm-hmm. They don't even know what the chemical balance of the brain is, let alone what it should be. It was all fabrication, as well as their DSM with all these these diagnoses. It's completely made up. There's not one objective test to substantiate a single diagnosis out of the almost 300 that are in that DSM right now. Not a one. Two-thirds of the people who made up that DSM are in cahoots with the pharmaceutical industry. So they have these meetings that they they go to uh, once every couple of years, and and they make up these diagnoses, and they just make them up out of thin air. They will vote them in, and they will vote them out. If mm-hmm. if they're on, uh, if they're not favorable, people don't like them. They vote them out of the DSM, you know. But they come in, and the guy goes in, hey, I got a new, uh, I got a new mental illness here, and they went, well, can we make a medicine for it? You know, can we treat it with something? That DSM is used mostly for, you know, writing insurance policies, you know, putting a diagnosis on for insurance. And it's well, it's completely made up. Previous DSMs had diagnoses that would be considered politically incorrect today. Yeah, mental retardation was one of them. Uh, homosexuality. Yeah, um, yeah homosexuality. Or, yeah, gender confusion. Uh, these were mental health diagnoses, and we'd usually find them on the autism spectrum. Um, but now it's, I'm not, I'm not here to be controversial at all. I'm just showing you how inconsistent even diagnosing is. You know, <laughs> Very, uh, we've talked about this before. We had to memorize that ridiculous book. Yeah, yeah. They made us do the kind of same thing. Yeah. And here's some of the ri- ridiculous diagnosis that they have right now. Mathematics disorder. If you don't like mathematics, you're disordered. You know, so, so I got that. They got <laughs> caffeine intoxication disorder. If you drink too much coffee, you're disordered. Something wrong with you, boy. You know, sibling relational disorder. These are kids who are fighting with one another. They're disordered. Uh, s- sexual orientation disturbance, homosexuality, Florence syndrome, being overwhelmed by the beauty, such as in Florence, Italy, feigning dizziness. Uh, they suggest that this be treated with antidepressants. The, these these guys are clowns, man. Paris syndrome, mostly Japanese patients visiting France. Symptoms include depression, anxiety, feelings of persecution. Earlier, that would have been known as uh, you know culture shock. 
they, they, they're totally out of control. You know, it's money, 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 money. Nobody's being cured of anything. No. And you go into a psychiatrist's office, you're not going to come out with some kind without some kind of drug and a diagnosis. You know, something's psych psychiatrically wrong with you. And, and now, what is it like? Half of the college students have some kind of psychiatric diagnosis now. You know, and they're when feeding was, feeding these things to kids. When I was working outpatient, one of the most popular medication regimens these young people would be on is Adderall and, and Ativan, or Adderall and Valium. Um, this this is abuse. This is addictive behavior. You know, these are, they, you these, refill it and you find degrading reviews online because you, you know, they're manipulating you. I, I mean, I wouldn't do it. I don't want my name on, on prescribing these meds, but the whole system's just wacky. <laughs> you know, look at, look at how wacky it is. Now, th these are statistics from several years ago. And at that time, it was more than 7.2 million kids are on psychiatric drugs. And th this was uh, I don't, uh, like, you know, 10 years ago. It's probably 10 times that now. Over 622,000 were under the age of five that they put on psychiatric drugs. Over 80,000 were given ADHD drugs, which are amphetamine. Over 38,000 were on antidepressants. Over 85,000 were on antipsychotics. These are the drugs that rot out your brain. Over 389,000 are on anti-anxiety drugs, which were addictive. And th this is what they're doing to our kids. Yeah. And none of these drugs cure anything. These young kids end up with metabolic syndrome. They become obese. They end up with diabetes, type two diabetes. They're just young kids. Just from these drugs. Antipsychotics uh, will cause obesity. Uh, and here's the other thing too, this is so ironic to me, it's so crazy. The bulk of our serotonin's in our gut, not our brain. So if you start to have poor nutrition, then you're gonna have metabolic disorder, you're gonna, it's gonna affect your, your mental health. Nutrition's everything, everything. You know, I love mace because nutrition won't cure trauma. <laughs> mace will. Um, they go hand in hand. I treat everybody I talk with, everyone I work with. I, I, it's, it's a double regimen. We clear the trauma, but but you, you need to educate them on how they're eating. Or, or, or we're poisoning ourselves. Yeah. So almost every person who has come to me um, seeking out the MACE energy method has a mistaken belief that there is something inherently wrong with them or broken about them because they have, as Jerry said, identified so closely with these negative identities. I wonder, is that your same experience? Yeah. Yeah. I have people who come to me and they go, something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. And I don't know how many people I've had that they come and they go, I, you know, something, something's not right. I, I just don't know what it is. You know, and oh, Mace, find, Mace finds it. One of the most interesting things for me is I'll have a client show up almost looking manic, looking like uh, pretty severe ADHD symptoms, talking fast, like they're trying to be heard and validated, and you kind of just have to. By the end of the session, you can even see all of that energy and negative energy is gone even from their face. It's like it, they're they're calm. Uh, I worked with one woman and it, I, I've, I've seen her now for a couple of sessions. She, she has severe trauma and I couldn't get her to slow down to even listen when I first started working with her. Now, if you look at the symptoms of trauma, it can resemble ADHD and mania. <laughs> mm -hmm. It looks the same. Yeah. I ran into the same thing a, a bunch of times. They come in and they're just frantic and, and uh, nervous and anxious. And at the end of the session, they're just, they're calm and they feel lighter. So explain the connection between trauma and that kind of manic behavior, because I really haven't heard that before. 
You want to start, Jerry? You want me to? Oh, go ahead. So the symptoms of trauma are fight or flight, uh, inability to focus, because you're constantly on, on fight or flight, uh, distracted easily, agitated easily, um, trouble sleeping, um, mind can't, can't focus, it's racing. A lot of the people who come to me are stuck in a loop. It's a loop, you know, um, but, you know, they're explaining their, their story. They don't know where the trauma is yet, but they think the problem is a relationship with this person or, and so they're just rapidly going in. And then he said that, and, and then this happened. And, and no matter what I do, I can't, they don't understand me and they're not validating me and on and on and on and on. And it has nothing to do with any of that. It's mm -hmm. that negative identity we have to find. And what, once we find it there, you know, when we, we move the a negative energy, um, you ask them how they feel about that person. And, and, and it's, I love them or pity or, yeah, or, I mean, it's an, a, an appropriate emotion now is attached to the person. Much more rational, not as frantic. Yeah. Not as reactive. Yeah. And it makes me think if so many of these children be putting on, you know, being put on Adderall and all the ADHD because schooling is traumatic. I've written three books to empower parents to, you know, take their kids out of these schools that are just trauma-based learning. And um, so, and I know Meg also has worked with a lot of children with a lot of success. Do you want to talk about that, Meg? Sure. Um, so I, we start off with um, our kids in an equine assisted um, therapy center. Um, they bring their kids to us because usually horses are their last option. Um, therapy hasn't worked. Talk therapy hasn't worked. And so um, we do use the horses because they are very in tune um, when we say when their insides don't match their insides, you know, what they're saying out with their mouth, it's not what's really going on the inside. And so the horses have an innate ability to pick up that something's wrong um, with these kids. And so a lot of these kids are in fight or flight, um, which helps because now they're in wide open spaces um, with the animals. But some of them are actually worse than that. They're in shutdown freeze mode and there's nobody home. And um, it's interesting. The horses will come up and, you know, push them and, and really nudge them and try to like make them move and do something. So the animals from, you know, the last 20 years I've watched this um, have had an incredible impact on finding these things. But at the end of the day, we can make them feel good and we can work on regulating them for an hour and then they go back home, right, into the environment and the triggers that started this. And then they're back the next week and we work on regulation again. And we just get stuck in a cycle. So I love the fact that MACE is so simple that kids can do this. Mm -hmm. It's the adults that get tripped up, right? We make it complicated. Yeah. Um, but the kids already have a great imagination. And so um, they're great at storytelling already. And so they're open to play in this game. Um, I think most kids are usually pretty fast disc creators of, of the trauma, of the issues um, within a session or two. Um, we've got different kids and I've seen it because the horses respond differently. It's night and day. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that with, uh, they have a YouTube channel with these horses that the um, English guards around the palace have, and they're trained to push people away and bite them if, if people get too close to the horse. But when somebody who's got a disability, like a down syndrome or uh, a retarded person or something like that the horse treats them very gently mm. you know it's almost amazing they can sense it just like you say they can sense it it's a spirit being it's a spirit being to a spirit being right yes yes and it's on a very deep connection level so um i love the fact that i can i can weave that mace in and out and janet i'm like you you know mace does clear a lot of trauma but at the end of the day, we still need to look at their sleep cycles and what they're eating and their environment and their blue light, their screen time. There's so many other components to it. So I feel like um, Mace is a perfect holistic component to get in there and take out the trash. And then we can start rebuilding on what they need for better habits. Yes. That's my big soapbox is nutrition. So 
I don't want to digress this podcast and head towards nutrition, but uh, it's the hardest thing for people to want to change also. They don't want to eat a healthy meal. They don't want to eat healthy. Mm. Yeah. And so they don't realize that that will impact every aspect of your body because it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to have a discussion. I know some of you guys have already talked about this um, in terms of spirituality, right? And, and how um, people of, of a special faith can feel comfortable going into this. I mean, it is called the MACE energy method. So, you know, some people I know are a little standoffish with just the name. So just curious what your experience is with helping people understand what this is um, and that they're in a safe place to do it. I've had several people ask, well, is this against the Bible? Is this anti-Christian? Is this, you know, and they were kind of hesitant. Um, it, it's not. I mean, it, it's got a, it's a, one section of it is a very scientific. The other section is spiritual, not religious, spiritual, you know, and it's your spirit, the, the spirit you have in you that we work with. And if that spirit disappears, if that spirit leaves, you're dead. Right. Yeah. So it's got it's got nothing to do with, you know, um, in, any kind of religion at, at all. Yeah. It's not it's not a religious it's a program. It's just a tool. Yeah, a, a if, powerful if, tool. If, if we named it um, uh, trauma therapy, uh, whatever, and gave it a generic name, we wouldn't we wouldn't even have the the little bit of pushback. It's it's, we talked about this, it's, it's that energy word, you know, um, and, and uh, I talked to one of our fellow practitioners in Australia, and she was around when John, you know, was still here, and John was very adamant on keeping, keeping the title energy, because that's really what we're doing, we're moving energy. Well, and I know some people might feel, well, you know, I suffer because my faith is not strong enough. If only my faith were stronger, then I wouldn't have any physical illnesses. I wouldn't have any mental problems. But so how would you address that? Because I think people can have very, very strong faith and they can still have these negative identities. I've definitely had clients with that. I'm glad you brought that up, Caprice. And a lot of these clients, I feel like are walking in guilt and shame because yeah. they know in their head that God loves them, but there's something inside that they cannot connect to. And they've been to deliverance conferences, they've prayed, they've had, you know, all these things happen, um, but they're still struggling. And usually what I find, you know, it makes, we do a relationship part of it. And usually um, when we start asking our questions, at some point, God, the father will come up as having um, an issue or a, a block there. Um, and so I love just helping people um, break down those, those false beliefs, find those negative identities that they've created at some point about God or mm -hmm. faith. Um, and you can just see the tears when they clear that because now they feel connected. They can feel the love that they know they've known has been there, but they haven't been able to experience it. So I know for me, I've had several clients, you know, that are, we're talking about schizophrenics and some of the other terrible trauma, but some of my clients are just looking how to be okay with God. Mm -hmm. and, and friend into that. Action. Yeah. So it's amazing how it works all across the spectrum. Well, I think religion in itself can cause trauma. Uh, I'll give you an example yeah. in my own life. When I was a young mom, extremely active in church you, you have the mom guilt it's put on you you know and I do believe in homeschooling caprice but all of this is put on you you know you 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 have to raise your kids a certain way you have to homeschool you have to do all these things and you know you you can easily get this negative identity of I, I can't measure up I can't I, I'm never going to be this this perfect mom um, all kinds of different uh, negative identities can come even from church, not even knowing it. Yeah. Right. And I'm, could be in a very abusive relationship where um, religion in the Bible is used against you. That's, I run into that quite a bit. That's common. 
you know, and that the guilt is laid back on top of you because, you know, God says honor, you know, or, or fill in the blank and, and, and you're traumatized by this person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think one, of I think school is so, if, every, if all of us had been taught who we are, what we are, how we operate, <laughs> what happens if we get triggered, we can clear it right away, then we wouldn't probably be having this conversation, but we're taught like the fake science of the big bang and evolution and you're a meat sack with the brain and there's this chemical imbalance. And so what we are taught is very disempowering. And, and what I've what I've seen is, I mean, the veterans need this so badly. Yes. You know, they're traumatized so yeah. badly. And, you know, I spoke to uh, one fellow who, he, he was kind of higher up in the Veterans Administration. He didn't, he didn't want to hear anything about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, they need this so badly. They need something that works for them because they come back so broken and, and their suicide rate is so high. I mean, this could help tremendously with them if, if they would adopt it. And you know, so they had Reiki in there. They had all this other stuff in there, but they, they didn't want to even consider this because it. And Reiki, it, uh, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the fact that, you know, there's minimal sharing because you talked about the veterans and, you know, we deal with a lot of domestic abuse, um, trauma, sexual abuse, trauma. And who wants to sit there and, and discuss again in detail what happened, when it happened and still not get any results from it. And so I love the fact that um, when clients come, we don't need to know all of those details. We're just looking for a feeling. Yeah, How that's, did it make you feel? That, that's amazing because the therapist don't, doesn't need to know what happened. You don't have to go through all that. If you've been through sexual trauma, you don't have to talk to the therapist about that. Like I uh, make saying, it's just the feeling that we're after during, during that trauma. I mean, you don't have to go through all that nasty stuff again. Well, I love too. I noticed that, you know, some of my people come and they're almost afraid of their own bodies because what you're feeling, the anxiety, you're feeling the tightness mm -hmm. and I love helping them connect to, Hey, you know, your body's actually trying to show you where the resistance is. It's actually pointing it out to you, you know? And so I feel like they come in almost being an enemy of their own self, their own body and by the time you discreate this and they feel the energy leave, they feel that resistance leave, they feel the heat leave. And then I feel like they can start to trust their body again. So when that comes up next time, you know, I said, now you've just become more emotionally intelligent. So when you feel that rise back up, when you feel that sensation again, if you feel it, you know, you're going to know that your body's trying to get your attention. There's something that you need to have run off. Um, so it is a mind, body, spirit experience. I love that. Yes. Absolutely. So do you want to share any case stories? Like, so if people are wondering, well, is the MACE energy method right for me? Because I've had people come and go, well, am I a candidate? Like, would it work with me? You know, because I think there's a lot of people who think, oh, well, I just wouldn't do it right. Or, um, I mean, I've helped people with trauma with porn addiction with alcohol dependency with sexual you know abuse rape date i mean there's just i i don't know of the only time it wouldn't help is if they didn't want to change right mm -hmm. yeah yeah even with schizophrenics i mean even though it might not get rid of the voices it gets rid of the trauma that feed the voices so yeah. they're going to come out of it better anyway if they can concentrate well enough to to follow through with the instructions. Yeah. Right. Well, and how did you discover, Jerry, that the voices weren't your patient's voices? Well, <laughs> what I what I discovered uh, at the state hospital is they, they ran patterns. And one of the first patterns was they were negative. They were consistently negative. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they reacted negatively to church or religion or the Bible or uh, you know, going to church or reading the Bible or talking to a preacher, they went nuts. They they didn't want anything to do with that. The third thing was that their energy level would drop when the voices hit. Okay, so mm -hmm. here I I found all these patterns. 
<clears throat> that were were showing up. And it, you know, it took me about a year to learn how to talk to these guys because there's no benefit for schizophrenics to tell anybody about the voices. They 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 get you know their friends leave them. Their family gets all upset. They take them to a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist puts them on awful drugs and, and turns them into zombies. So, you know, there's there's no real benefit for this. So they usually keep those voices inside. They don't tell people. Um, so I started asking them because nobody in the state hospital was curious about what the voices were or what they were saying. They were taught they were they were hallucinations in in graduate school or medical school, and they just went with that. Nobody was curious about what they're telling these people. And it was clear that um, the, when they were listening to the voices, they got into some kind of trouble. They got into fights. They, they mm -hmm. got into arguments. They, the, it was some kind of trouble. They quit classes. The, it was something. Uh, so I started asking, what are they telling you? And one of them went and told a psychiatrist, uh, hey, this guy's asking us about the voices. Uh, I don't like it. It, it. I don't like what he's doing. So I got called in the psychiatrist office and ordered to, to stop asking them about what the voices were saying. I was told that I was making the patient worse by reinforcing their hallucinations you know, and ordered to stop and, and threatened. And that, that happened twice. So they don't want to know what these voices are. I mean, and that's the main symptom of paranoid schizophrenia. And they don't want to know about it. They don't want to ask any questions about it. So the way I found out that they were actually, I was in denial for, for decades. I mean, probably close to 20 years. As these patterns kept increasing, I started wondering what would happen if I started throwing monkey wrenches into those patterns and, and screwing them up. So the first thing that happened is my patients would come back and this was in the, in the state prison when I was working in the psychology department where I had a captive group of schizophrenics who agreed to work with me and tell me what the voices were saying in real time. So we had an, an agreement and uh, they started coming back and saying, you know, when I started throwing monkey wrenches into the patterns, they came back and they said, the voices don't like it. They don't like you. They don't want us coming here. And I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting for a hallucination. Next thing was, uh, Another guy comes in and uh, he, as he's leaving my office, he turns around and he looks at me. He says, uh, you know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And I didn't think so. I'm like, they're, they're stuck in your head. They're not in my head. You know, uh, it was it was weird. So I, I just tucked it away. I didn't forget it, you know, because he was serious when he said it. Third thing that happened was one patient came into the medical unit to the psych office knocked on my door and said, the voices want to talk to you. And that had never happened before in 20 years. Yeah. Never. It was always, I would talk to the patient. The patient would tell the voices what I said. Uh, then the patient would tell me what the voices said. Okay. So I was always conversing you know, with, with the voices, uh, but it was never a direct conversation. So he said, the voices want to talk to you. And I went, that's weird. It, it kind of weirded me out because that had never happened before. And I said, well, come on in. What do they have to say? <laughs> the, these words came out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life. Boom. That was the end of my denial system. It just <laughs> collapsed. It just totally collapsed. You know? So it was like uh, it was like a warning, but I didn't heed it. You know, I just kept working with these guys. The next thing that happened was um, I was reading the book um, by a, a, a shaman, uh, Miguel Ruiz, and he was talking about these things being parasitic. And I already knew they were parasitic because when the voices attacked, the, the patient's energy just vanished. It was gone. You know, and it happened with virtually all of them. So there was a, a strong pattern, a one, almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with it. Um, so I brought in this book to one of the schizophrenics I was working with, I had a relationship with, and I said, I, I'd like your opinion on what, what this guy says. I started reading it. And then behind my head, a loud electrical crackle started. It was just sounded just like an arc welder. It was like crack, crack, crack. And then it started moving up the wall to my right. And I'm like, 
what the frick is going on? You know, I didn't see anything. I didn't smell anything, but you could hear it moving at a 45 degree angle up the wall. And I'm like, I couldn't see anything. So I, I turned to him and he looks like a zombie. He's just frozen. You know, he's just staring at me. And I said, do you hear that? And he just sat there looking. He didn't respond. It was like, he, he looked like some kind of, and I thought he was going to attack. So I pushed my chair against the wall. And so I could kick him back if he came on. And then I'm trying to split my attention between um, him and this crackling that's going on in my office. So it crackles all the way up the wall to the left. It cuts across the ceiling and then starts crackling down the left wall, jumps into this Rubbermaid trash can by my left leg. And I look in there, there's nothing there. It's just crackling. And then boom, it just goes out like that. You know? And then he, I look at him and he gets up very slowly and he goes, I got to leave. And he shuffles down the, the hallway and I'm like, yeah, yeah, get out of here. Get, go, go. You know? So it took me about three or four months to get up the courage to call him back. I didn't want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> so finally I called him back and he looks good. You know, he, he, I'm like, I thought you'd be a wreck. You know, if, if these things were that powerful, you know, I thought you'd be a wreck. And I asked him, I said, did you hear that crackling in the office the last time you were here? He said, yeah, I heard it. But he says, I'm surprised you did. And I said, what in the blazes was that? And he said, that was the voices. I said, what were they doing? He said, they were trying to scare you off. And I said, mm -hmm. they did a damn good job of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I asked him, well, you looked like a zombie when you walked out of here. And I said, well, what were the voices telling you when you walked out of my office? He said, they were telling me to go get a shank and stick it in your gut. And I'm thinking, ah, he wouldn't do that. You know, I've worked with this guy for six months. He wouldn't do anything like that. So I asked him, I said, well, why didn't you do it? And he said, I couldn't find one and nobody would give me one. Wow. So that's how I knew that these things were real. I mean, that I, crackling went on for like 25 seconds, 30 seconds. It wasn't just a, a brief blur. It wasn't just like a, a, a little blurb. I mean, it stayed. It was there for a while. I had a similar experience. I don't share it because it's just unbelievable. You know, it's just unbelievable. Uh, it entailed a large spider. When I say large, I, large, bulbous, shiny black, ran all the way across the room. Client saw it too. It was so large, I don't, and then it was gone. Just vanished? J gone. Just, just vanished into thin air. So it went like behind the bookcase and it gone. And there's nowhere it could have gone those the the size it was. It just was gone. Now to tell stories like this, people just kind of oh come on, come on. But it was as real as real could be. Now, there's, there's one nurse I work with every once in a while. She could see spirits from the time she was a young child. And she describes spiders that attach themselves to people. They look like spiders. It was hideous. It And I, I kept researching on the Internet to try and find, like, what is a spider? It, 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 black widows are very small. Yeah. But it had the bulbous, shiny black body like a black widow in the the body itself was this big and it had like lightning strike red on on the top part of its abdomen there's no spider even remotely like that except in i think australia and it wasn't even correctly the same kind of spider it was hideous hideous um i didn't want to work there anymore <laughs> I, yeah. my, and I have a new office so. Yeah, so there, there's entities out there, and and they put these negative thoughts into your mind. If you believe them, then you become them. You know, so Manuel Swedenborg says none of your thoughts are your own. They either come in from heaven or hell. That you're just a receptor. You decide which ones you want to pay attention to. You decide you're going to be a, pay attention to the wrong ones. That's going to leave you stuck with negative identities.
That's kind of the concept of why trauma is like an open door for oppression. Yes. Because trauma has that negative identity and those oppressive thoughts are just going to play on it over and over. And, and you look at the history of schizophrenics, virtually all of them suffered some kind of massive physical, emotional, or sexual trauma. I mean, it's just, it's there. It's there consistently. Yeah. So I've worked with schizophrenics where we couldn't get rid of the voices, but we got rid of a lot of the trauma, which helped tremendously because the voices feed on it. Well, and there's a lot that we're encouraged to do in our society that kind of opens the doors to these negative demonic entities. You know, before we push record, we were talking about the use of alcohol or marijuana or meth or a lot of, you know, people will just think that some of their recreational habits are pretty innocent, but they are not, are they? No, they're not. Matter of fact, when I was working in the psychology department of the state prison, I never saw so many people people who had gone psychotic using meth and they were just as crazy as the people who were crazy from normal circumstances you know and the way it happens they start hearing voices and they go well that's a hallucination it'll go away when i come down and it does and and it may happen a, a few more times it may happen 10 20 30 more times and then one day the voices don't go away yeah. they're there permanently you know mm -hmm. and then then they're just as psychotic as, as any of the ones in the state hospital. It's a very, very dangerous drug. You know, another thing dangerous is Ouija boards. You know, I've, sp I've spoken to a number of people who've started talking to these entities on the Ouija board, and then they transferred into their heads, and they were hearing them in their heads now. Ouija boards are dangerous. They should be outlawed. Very... I have a thought. I, I wonder how you all feel about this. I've been running into this a couple of times. Are the people playing with AI online, talking to AI, um, they're becoming, I won't go there. How do you feel about some of the AI and what might happen? Have you, any of you experienced people who have been playing with it online and I've gotten some really negative uh, feedback from it? Mm -hmm. I, I've never experienced it. No, but I've contemplated AI a lot because what does AI lack? It lacks a conscience. It lacks mm -hmm. empathy. And they really want to replace teachers with AI in schools. Mm -hmm. And so you can teach someone anything based on the algorithms that are programmed into it. And they're not going to have a conscience or empathy. So I tread very carefully. I'm not a big user of AI. Yes, me too. But, um, I saw it. Um, a lot of people were very bored during COVID. So they ventured into a lot of things that mm, probably weren't the best for them. So. Right. Well, and I have a friend who did a presentation that she shared with me, 280 pages on the new age movement. And, you know, I grew up with a lot of, you know, meditate, empty your mind, be open-minded. Well, if you have an empty, empty mind, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an open door, right? <laughs> Come, on <in. laughs> Come on in. Give me some thoughts here. I don't... So when I meditate, it's around prayer. It's around scripture. It's with a direct focus on our creator. Connecting. It's kind of like the end of the Mace uh, session. I love the ending of, of, of that session because you're really experiencing your own spirit connecting to your higher power. You know, it's a beautiful way to end the session. Yeah, they're, they're closer to who they really are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Including even getting rid of the positive identities because that's not really who we are either. You know, we're, we're a spiritual being. You know, I, I, I'm not Janet, the MACE practitioner. That, I mean, that's what I do to, to evolve in this world, but that's not really who I am. I'm this beautiful spiritual being. That reminds me too, Jerry, have you ever, ever had anybody tell you that when they hear voices, they're encouraging and loving and kind and wonderful? No, they they usually don't speak in words, the, the positive ones. They speak in feelings and intuition. Unless the person is on the verge of death, 
Now, when I was working in the emergency room, I mean, doing psych crisis in the emergency rooms the last 10 years I was employed by someone else, is these people would come in every once in a while who should have been dead by all normal circumstances. I mean, they couldn't have survived what they did. It just made no sense that they survived what they attempted. One lady, um, she got she got fired. She was about to get evicted. Uh, she uh, got was divorced. All this piled up on her at the same time. She couldn't handle it anymore. She decided she was going to go. She couldn't kill herself. She couldn't bring herself to kill herself. So she decided she was going to go to a railroad tack in, in Benson, you know, small town south of here and wait for the train to come and and drive her car in front of the train. So she was on the phone with her sister telling her sister goodbye in San Diego. She was drunk and, and drugged up and uh, the train's coming. So she hung up. When the train got close, she drove her car right in front of the train and the train plowed into her car, threw the car over onto a second track and a second train hit the car again. So she was hit by two trains and then it was thrown like 50 yards off the road and it was like a crumpled beer can. I mean, they, she was in there, but they couldn't get her out because everything was so crumpled. They had to cut her out of that car. And two hours later, she's sitting in front of me in the emergency room with me doing a psych evaluation and all she had was a black eye. Wow. And I'm like, how could this be? You know, how could this be? And I asked her, I said, uh, you know, what were you thinking when you came to in, in the car? She said, I was absolutely furious. I did not want to be here. She said, I was just mad as a hornet. And I said, uh, well, what, what happened after that? And she said, I heard this voice come and tell me everything's going to be OK. And oh, she wow. said she just felt this this energy flow through her body like everything was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after I evaluated her, I said, I, I don't think she's suicidal anymore. But I never thought psychiatry would let her out. You know, so right. I made my recommendation that she be released and they let her out. Wow. You know, so it was it was th these kind where you could tell that there was something at work there. There was another guy had a, a 357 Magnum revolver. All the cylinders were loaded. He put it to his head and it went click, put it to the ground, bang, put it to his head, click a second time, put it to the ground, bang. And he went, OK, I got it. <laughs> another, yeah. another guy, uh, the voices told him to uh, uh, get a gun drive his car out into the desert until he ran out of gas, then go out in the desert and, and shoot himself in the head. So he did that. He drove out to the desert. He ran out of gas. He took the gun. He went and sat down and he, he cocked the gun. He was ready to put it to his head. And he said this bird showed up, that a bird he'd never seen before. And he lived in Arizona all his life. He said that bird started screaming at him. It's just absolutely screaming at him. So he took the gun and he fired a shot at it. And the blast of the gun woke him up. So, so these voices, when they put people in a, in a suicidal trance, they kind of, it's kind of like a hypnotic trance almost. And the blast of the gun woke him up and he looked at the gun. And he goes, what was I going to do? You know? So what we have in the United States right now is over 50,000 people a year killing themselves. Virtually a large segment of them are on psychiatric drugs or on antidepressants yeah. or on antipsychotic drugs. Yes. I mean, there's 50,000 people died in the 10 years in the Vietnam War. And this is happening year after year after year after year. And these bozos keep prescribing these drugs that don't cure anything. They just ameliorate the symptoms. And look at what we're getting. The veterans have a very high suicide rate. And we've got more psychiatrists on the planet now than we've ever had on the history of mankind, more psychologists, more psychiatric drugs. And we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Suicide rate is climbing every single year. Nothing they're doing is working. Now we have mace, and they're not going to want that coming in because it works. Yeah. yeah. I had um, a couple of patients kill themselves from protect, protracted withdrawal. They could not withdraw off the medications, and it was torture. They were having severe akathisia, uh, suicidal thoughts, 
um, incredible anxiety. Um, I don't know if you know what akathisia is. Oh yeah. It's, it feels like the best way I can describe it is have, have you ever had restless leg syndrome? That's all over your body. Your entire body just can't sit still and it has to move. Um, and it's, it just creates so much more anxiety too. You can't sleep, you can't calm down, you can't comfort yourself. And it's a common side effect. It's not rare, it's common. So yeah. we prescribe meds to keep the akathisia down, but it doesn't work. It's just but more so, side effects. <laughs> so here, here's, here's some of the common side effects of SRI, SSRI antidepressants. Uh, antidepressants, nausea, weight gain, trouble sleeping, dry mouth, blurred vision, dizziness, anxiety, headache, diarrhea or constipation, sexual problems, fatigue, tremors, increased swelling, lower alcohol tolerance, bleeding, lower sodium levels, vomiting, restlessness, muscle clamps, and seizures. And and that's just for um, uh, antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, loss of appetite, blurred vision, dizziness, uh, fatigue, dry mouth, agitated restlessness, headaches, sexual dysfunction, sleep problems, increased blood pressure, stomach aches, sweating. Um, memory loss. Yep. Huge with and, those memory and, loss. And the antipsychotic drugs are even worse. Mm -hmm. So this is what they're treating these people with. They're making them worse. They're not making them any better. They're not curing anything. And these guys are making billions of dollars a year on stuff that doesn't work. And they have the entire planet brainwashed into like, you know, these are the Egyptian priests of old. You know, we're psychiatry, we're, we're, you know, big pharma. We know what's going on. They have control of the educational institutions. They're teaching this crap in, in graduate school and medical school. And it does not work. Janet and I have been through it. Okay. We've been through I the whole range. On my education. I do too. <laughs> I, I learned a whole bag of lies. I did too. A whole, a whole bag of lies. Even I, I remember when you were just talking about voices, we had to discern, okay, is the voices outside the head, inside the head? Like that made a difference? Like what, what are you teaching us? Well, well, it kind of does in a, in a way. That, that when they move outside the head, they they're, it's like we're no longer worried about you doing anything about us. So what I'm saying though is it's not a hallucination. No, it's neither, not neither one is a hallucination. Yeah. You know? So why do I care if it's inside or outside? It's not a hallucination. But they don't realize that. <laughs> yeah. That's what they believe. That's what they've taught. You know, they go up, uh, well, why would you want to know something about something you already feel you know? <laughs> you know, so they already brainwash them. They're brainwashing, you know, they're putting out thousands of psychiatrists every year and psychologists who believe that these voices are hallucination. Yeah. These and things are why, evil spirits. We don't recruit the best in the lot to work with uh, mental health patients. Um, an awful lot of the people who head toward working in mental health shouldn't be there. They're just... They don't have a heart for people. You know, I'm not saying everybody in the industry is terrible, but it really comes down to just a big mill of making money. Yeah. Yep. Well, and now that you thoroughly understand the MACE energy method, isn't mental health a misnomer? <laughs> I call it all, all of it's some form of, it's either trauma or poor nutrition. We, were, we weren't created broken. No. Right, right. We didn't come here this way. Right. But we have an answer now. We can help. And I love the fact, you know, for us, we work with a lot of special needs children, nonverbals. And so, you know, we've been talking about people running sessions that can talk and talk about feelings. But now, even with some of the ways we can use MACE, we can work with children that are nonverbal. We can work with elderly. Um, I use it on animals. Um, our rescues yeah. come in that I don't know why they're not doing what they're doing. Well, we can track it and clear it. And again, horses don't lie. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's night and day. Sometimes the stuff that comes off of them. So um, it's, it's a beautiful tool. All it takes is zoom or face to face. Um, 
it's a super easy method, truly. If kids can get it, adults can get it. Yeah. Right. right. Well, and it's astounding that we get results in hours, not months or years. And, you know, I was asking uh, a man I did a session with, we were just chatting afterwards and I was, you know, I was like, why do you, why do you think this would be difficult to promote? And he said, because there's so much bunk out there that's saying that it's effective. So when you have something that's this effective and this quick with no self-disclosure, I think it's like people have been, I don't know, it's hard for them to believe. Yeah, uh, they, they, they're yeah. amazed when when they're done the set. They're amazed. It's like, right. wow, I feel different. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not the same re- person. They refer everyone in around their family sees like what happened, and that then we're getting their family members too coming in. So it's it's funny to watch them look for that feeling. You know that they've just discreated from something, and they're you can tell they're trying their best to right. find it, and it's it not there. <laughs> it, it's it's gone. <laughs> and they go, where'd it go? Where'd it go? I've had this for years. What happened to it? Yeah. Well, and I tell people that anything you do not like about yourself is just a negative identity and you created it. We can discreate it. And I think I want to circle back to with, you know, Jerry, you started with talking about the energetics of how this works. And so if we are perfect spiritual beings, the reason that we feel so uncomfortable with these heavy, dense feelings is because they're just not natural to us, right? Right. They were installed at some point, you know, by uh, you know, mental, physical, emotional trauma of, of some sexual abuse. You know, and nobody get you know, nobody on this planet gets by without trauma. I mean, if you're on this planet, this is a very difficult planet to live on. You know, if you went you, to school, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Or yes. you're not going to school. <laughs> we'll do it. Right. Right. Yeah, school is traumatic. And yeah. then the high the higher you get up in the ladder, the more traumatic it gets. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. And That's the, the, why the, I ended up seeing you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. even even clients that are, you know, stuck in business. I know Caprice and I talked about that as well, that come to us. You don't, you know, you don't have to be a schizophrenic to benefit no. from this. There's there's high functioning executives that they don't know why they're dealing with anxiety. They're not sleeping. Now they're not functioning at work. They don't understand why they can't complete projects. Um, and this is a beautiful method, especially being non-disclosure. You know, it's a lot of these people don't want their stuff known. Um, and so they can come in, they can come out and actually get some relief in Mm -hmm. just a couple of sessions and they're on their way. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, I think like Capri said, anything that you don't like about your life, whether you, I just can't complete a task. I can't lose weight. I can't get along with my spouse. Whatever it is, is a negative identity playing out. And we see all walks of life. I've seen authors, musicians, uh, sports people, uh, but we see all walks of life. It's not just what society would consider mental health issues. Yeah, we, I had a medical whatever doctor. Whatever mental health is, you know, we all have mental health. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've worked with a medical doctor. I've worked with uh, uh, PhDs. Um, you know, to all walks of life, nobody's immune from trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, I had a friend um, call me one day and she had just gotten back from a vacation with like the extended family of her husband. You know how extended family can really trigger you. He's like, that's it. I hate him. I'm getting a divorce. I was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, You're going to do a May session with me first. And she'd known about it, but she was a little put off as a Christian or I don't know. So we sat down and we did it. And literally a week and a half later, she sent me a picture of her and her husband on the beach. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So like people don't know what, like you don't know what triggers you. If you knew what it was, Right. right. You're only at effect of what you do not know about. Right. Right. The other thing I find is um, often they'll go, oh, I, I don't I don't have an issue with that anymore. I've already worked on it. Yeah, I heard that a lot, too. Oh, huh. <laughs> but yet you're seeing the trigger. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, like, no, you talked it to death and you and you you logically understand it, you think. But we're not dealing with logic. We're dealing with emotion. We're I had one like that last emotion. week. 
I had one like just like that last week. I've yeah. been working on this for years. It's gone. Believe me, I I got you know. And then we we ran it, and and there it was. You know, I said, well, <laughs> here it is. You know, here's the negative identity. This is what it's composed of. You didn't get rid of it. It's right here in front of you. Now we're going to get rid of it. Yeah. You're just good at burying it. A lot of yeah. us are really good at burying it. I yeah. thought I I thought I had dealt with things in my past. I had no idea when I was seeing Jerry that we were going to clear things I didn't even think I was going to see him for. I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> I thought I dealt with that. <laughs> so. And it's amazing how much energy it takes to keep these things buried in the Oh, cell. yeah. And how much energy you get back when you get rid of them. Because it does take a lot of energy to keep them buried in your subconscious there. They're constantly trying to break out. It takes a lot of energy to hold them in there. Well, mm -hmm. you don't heal. You don't, you can't be creative, right? You're, you're just stuck in this response of, of trying to manage. How many people have come to you just saying, I'm just trying to manage. I'm just getting by. That's not living. No, no, there, there's not a peace in their soul. They're, they're praying and trying so hard to, I, I forgive. I yeah. forgive. Yeah, they yeah. Know they're being triggered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I had that last week too. I've I've forgiven all these people. Well, well, let's take a look at your mom. You know, and here comes <laughs> here comes this this freaking three foot long negative identity come rolling out of her. <laughs> yeah, she's a bitch. She's this. She was cold. She was loving. Da, 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 da. Yeah, you got rid of it, did you? <laughs> You've been working years to get rid of it. Now they're here. What's this we got, here? We're good at cleaning it up. That's the other thing. When I when I speak with people, you know, with a church background or something, I mean, they're very good at keeping things squeaky clean. You know, yeah. we're you're not supposed to feel that. You're not supposed to think that and do that. Um, so it's really interesting once you start encouraging people to connect and identify with those feelings. I tell them, don't clean it up. Just say what you're what you're feeling. Just yeah. put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another funny thing is they'll come in and they'll actually get kind of agitated at first. I've worked on that already. Yeah. I'm good there. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, well, that's a negative identity right there also. So, <laughs> so let's, let's start with anger. <laughs> so. Well, and what I've found is if people have engaged in years and years of talk therapy, what they've been doing is thinking and analyzing their problems right. to death, and they've actually been feeding them energy. So when I find someone who's like, I've done so much talk therapy or their backgrounds in psychology, I have to say, okay, you need to put your analytic self to the side for this process to really work. Because if you're analyzing and thinking, you will slow it down or stop it. And they get that. They go, oh, you know, like if analyzing your problems had worked, you probably wouldn't be sitting here with me. I was one of those, you me know, too. I, I put it together and I was going to figure it out and do it myself. And um, so, yeah, I was that client, Caprice. <laughs> me too. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm a very much do-it-yourself type girl. And so when I was like, wait, the MACE message is not do-it-yourself. It took me a minute to really understand that you can't both be the client and the practitioner. Like you can't occupy two identities at once. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. It would be interesting if somebody did the research on how many people going through the mental health system recovered. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't think it, it would, would be, be many. Right. Yeah, I think it would be rare yeah. because it, it doesn't heal. No, no. Well, you learn coping skills, and those aren't always bad. So you you have to still do life and take care of your family and go to work. You have to do that. Um, I know. I, the more I've gotten into May, so the more frustrated I get in typical sessions because I'm like, okay, if we could just close our eyes, and yes, and yeah. we'd be done. Yes. <laughs> Focus right there. Close your eyes. You're on it. There it is. It's right there. You're right there. Let's do it. <laughs> Forget all the breathing exercises, you know. <laughs> wait, wait. You need to understand and hear this. No, I don't. Nope. No, no, I, I don't. don't. No, I really don't. <laughs> well, they, and then, uh, yeah. They, it's like they have to explain. You know, yeah. so I want to tell you my entire history. I, go, no, I, don't, I don't need to, but it's almost like I got to let them tell some of it or they, exactly. you know, they just, them. Yeah. 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 But if, well, once they, once they start to get through like halfway through the session, they get it. They get it. I don't yeah. need to tell you anything. You know? 
you know, yeah. and they'll even catch it. Oh, and I love it's oh. their own journey. I love, I love the fact that, um, you know, it doesn't rely on us doing anything to them. Um, I always tell them, I'm just your coach. I'm here to walk. This is your journey. And I'm just here to walk you through it. It's, it's not hypnosis. Um, I'm not convincing you of anything. I'm just there to be a mirror to show you kind of what, you know, you're talking, what you're saying. I'm using your words yeah. to help you see your, your 3D creation, what you've made. Yeah, um, they do the work. Yes. They do we're the heavy the, lifting. <laughs> we're, the, we're the tour guide. Right. Here we go. Yeah. Right. And when I say to a client, you just got rid of that one. Well done. Yeah. They just smile. Like they just know, like they knew that it was them doing it. And they're so happy that they're in control again yeah yeah it's an amazing process it is you know what's coming to me is as i'm thinking about what you know janet you and jerry have shared about the harms of the pharmaceutical drugs i'm thinking not only are they harming them physically um but then like someone's giving someone in a position of authority is like here take this pill it's going to fix you and then if it makes you worse, then you're just thinking, okay, well, I, maybe I'm not fixable. Like maybe I really yeah. am that broken, right? It's another yeah. layer of abuse. Well, the other thing I saw working in the prison is, is all these, these prisoners who were using meth, a lot of them started off on Ritalin or Adderall. And, and I would ask them, I said, well, you, you were feeling good when you were on the Rit Ritalin. And why did you keep upping it? You know, mm -hmm. they said, well, I don't know. So... So they went from Ritalin to, to powdered meth to crystal meth, and then they went psychotic, and they ended up in prison. Because they're developing tolerance. Yeah. You know, it's not it's uh, it's only going to work so long at each dose. And you reach a point where there's not a high enough dose. I mean, you know, take the bottle. <laughs> it's just too much. Um, mm -hmm. I would be really, really also interested in seeing how many people attempting suicide or committing suicide who are already on these meds. Yeah. I, I would have to, do you remember that lady um, with the train wreck? Was she on antidepressants? I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember, but yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't want that information out. Right. You know, nobody's going to look into that. You know, the, yeah, they're going to pay them not to. Yeah. There are some really, well, I know, like, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I know just, you know, with families that come for therapy, it's almost become like, well, what, what, what drug are you on? What pill are you on? You know, I think since we started seeing these commercials on TV, it's become a household name. Like right. if you're not on something from your doctor. What's wrong with you? You know, you need, right. you need to get with it. It's, it's become so overly accepted where, you know, my generation, we would, we would be embarrassed. Right. Think we would have to be on something like that. Right. So it's not just the adults, but it's my kid. Now my kids on da da da. Oh, my kid didn't take his meds. You know, it's, it's just such common language now. Um, and it's almost like they feel like they don't have another option. Yeah. They don't see another option. And, and all these, all this propaganda that the pharma companies put out is like, well, there is no other option. Same thing with the psychiatric mafia. You're, you're schizophrenic. That's a life sentence. You've got to take these drugs for the rest of your life. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Right. You know, it's bull crap. Right. And community mental health has infiltrated the school system. So they're actually in the school system evaluating these kids, starting them on meds, you know, and, oh. and and an awful lot of these kids will be, they'll be sent to our office saying uh, they're going to be expelled unless we get them on a med uh, to control their behavior. It's atrocious. Right. Well, I was like kind of convinced or told that because of relationship trauma that I had with my ex-husband who... I guess you could label him as either psychopathic or sociopathic. So I went through this specific recovery, living recovery program and they told me, well, you know, you're just always going to be a cracked vessel because of this experience. You'll oh, never get a trauma. <laughs> and then they said, but that's okay because the cracks let the light in. And I just remember thinking, oh, oh. I don't really <laughs> carry that with me the rest of my life. And no. so like, I'm someone who can say you can heal any relational trauma as well. Yeah. yeah. Mace Absolutely. is good for that. Yeah. Absolutely. I um 
It's so important and for me in my spiritual journey, and I think anybody spiritual, we can't be walking around with these unforgiving hearts, mm -hmm. these hearts carrying anger or, or animosity towards others. It's, it it's, eat you up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you see like the older people in our society, how weighed down they are. They're just hunched over. And now that I can see a negative identities and when someone's reacting, I see it's not them. It's a negative identity. And I have a lot of compassion. I just wonder how, you know, they just have the weight of years of carrying these negative identities with them. Mm -hmm. And um, they too can get rid of them in, in hours. If you have a family member who has chronic anger, Mace can clear that up pretty quick because that's a negative identity. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times people, depression also. Yeah, we should not be walking around reacting at everyone and everything and road rage and you know that we can clear that. Well, just Try to give an example that. too, we can move that energy. <laughs> so. Yeah, there we go. I know. I just did one um, a surrogate session on a child whose mom brought her in for anger. She was hitting mom, dad, sister school this was a five-year-old you know totally um unruly and not able to self-regulate and most people would put her on meds right because she uh -huh. needs to go to school without getting in trouble well within one may session i'm um, with mom being surrogate we found out it went all the way back to a surgery she had as a two-month-old she had trauma from wow. that wow. and she was actually um having a, a issue with her dad for whatever reason you know we don't analyze what does what in in our May session um but she was obviously having triggers in reacting to that so I mean the mom was in tears when we were done just just thinking oh it's not that my child's just angry all the time that's just how it was manifesting that's how it was showing up so um, that poor little girl would have been started on a bellify and like an antipsychotic, Jerry, that's nasty. Uh, and that's FDA approved for five-year-olds. Um, for developing and, brains, right? The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing's horrible. And um, the sad part is, this is how flaky the diagnosing system is. Uh, they're now diagnosing like um, potential bipolar in kids this age because of the agitation. You know, it's just yeah. crazy. Bipolar. I mean, even, I, it's even embarrassing to say half this stuff anymore. You know, it's okay. just, it's, yeah. It's all about the money. Yeah. You know, money, money, money. Right. Well, and we haven't even touched on birth trauma and how many people are affected by birth trauma, whether they, you know, were a cesarean or there was and just. gestation. There are things can happen during gestation, you know, to that child too. Um, mom can have poor nutrition, you know, just lots of, th that would be another fascinating podcast. Well, I, I had one who was traumatized in a past life. Mm. She, she was a healer in medieval uh, England and they burned her at the stake. And, you know, I'm like, well, that, that's interesting. So we worked through that and it, and it came back and it, it was gone. You know, she was a different person after we got that trauma out of the way. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I've never experienced that before. Yeah. So I haven't experienced that. And I'm glad because I don't know what I would do with that. Um, but I, I do I do have a few patients that they're willing to reveal this um, from satanic ritual abuse. Meg, you might have seen that in... in you know, because you're a pastor's wife. Um, but mm. that's hard to get out because it's so ingrained in them. Yeah. Uh, it's horrendous what happens there. I mean, to their soul and spirit. I mean, yeah. fracturing. Yes. Um, but, but here's the thing. God always heals. Yeah. That's what we have to, to remember. And he his design is to have us congruent, aligned, clean, put together. So love flows, right? Yes. And it's these negative identities that wind up blocking that, getting us out of alignment and creating issues. So it's spirit that does the healing. That the, yes. we're just we're just the tour guides, kind of moving stuff out of the way. We don't do the actual healing. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. 
That's probably a really positive note to end on. Is there anything anyone would like to add to this conversation? Well, if if you if you're thinking about taking some of these toxic drugs, please go to www.causisminstitute.com. That's C A U S I S M institute.com and find yourself a mace therapist there before you start taking these toxic drugs. Right. Do yourself a big favor. Absolutely. And I will put the link to the Causism, Causism Institute in the description, as well as the link to everyone's website here. So if you could reach out to any of us individually, if you would like to just do a, you know, a discovery session and see if this is right for you. But we do have practitioners around the world that can help you as well. And we see people all around the world. And yeah, we can see you. You don't have to go anywhere. We can see you over Zoom or Skype. You know, you, 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 you can do this from your own house. Absolutely. Thank oh. you, Caprice, for having us. Thank yeah, you. well, thank you all for joining us. And I would love to have another conversation soon because this was a rich one and we still have a lot we can talk about. So thank you all for your time. <laughs>